1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we will finish this chapter today, Lord willing, and one verse into chapter 11 that I believe is part of this section. Beloved, it's essential for every church to properly balance evangelism and discipleship. If a church is only concerned with seeing numerical growth, or if it is only focused upon just the members within, both are out of balance, both are out of line. It's important that we have our eyes to those who don't yet know Christ and that we care for our brothers and sisters in Christ within the body. Discipleship should be well balanced with evangelism. You have to have both. You can't have one without the other. You need both. Discipleship and evangelism, both are needed. That'll come up on the screen. By God's grace, we have to have both oars in the water. Now, last summer, I went out with the ninth graders. Those, they're in ninth grade this year. It's the Fresh Star program at Lake Ann. And as we were on the water in these rafts, I was with a certain group. It was a group of girls. And there was one particular girl in the raft. She didn't pay attention to the rest of her cabin mates. And when we were going down the river, they would hit some points where we could just enjoy and float and talk. And this one particular girl, rowing, rowing, rowing. I mean, she was just getting it. And her, te you know, her, her teammates, her cabin mates were like, um, okay, we can rest now. And she would just keep rowing. And I kind of watched the dynamics unfold as her cabin mates were getting frustrated with, do you realize what you're causing us to do? It's do this down the river. And all along are tree stumps and danger points. And, and if you can just float down the river, you're good to go. But if you're doing this down the river, donuts, it's not really enjoyable. And they were trying to get this young lady to, do you see what we're doing? Could you do what we're doing? Could you be concerned with those around you? This was a fail. And her counselor was watching this. And no doubt through the week, her counselor understood, I have some work to do with this young lady because this lady likes to be in control at all times and she doesn't like to take anybody, anybody's advice around her. She thinks she knows it all and everyone should be doing just what she's doing. But the goal wasn't to just get done with the river. The goal was to enjoy one another and work on various objectives while on the river to not just finish the journey, but to actually have that journey do something in the hearts and lives of those young people. And I saw that happen. I saw that unfold. I, I absolutely love that week. Looking forward to it again next summer. Discipleship and evangelism. Part of being in a family, part of being in a group, is considering the family, it's considering the group as a whole before pursuing self-centered desires. What I want and well, what I wish. It's more important to understand what is the will of God, and I've been saying that for some time. When we come together as a church family, it is not to pull the will of the people. It is to discern the will of God and do that. And often, that's hard. It's difficult. It's challenging. We're different. We've talked a lot about this. If you look around you, there's a lot of people that don't look like you. Now, if you're sitting with your family, they might look like you. They might act like you. Sorry about that, right? You can apologize to them later. All right? We're... we're uh, we're different. And one of the biggest, most important lessons that God, I have to be careful of what tense I put this in, has been teaching me an ongoing tense in marriage was that I didn't get married to my wife and the Lord didn't give me a wife so I could change her and make her like me. <laughs> Lowell's laughing. He's like, no way, that would be stupid. <laughs> I'm probably not alone in that. We are to both grow in grace and to become more like Christ. And that's very different than me fixing my wife. Having her be the way that I think or act like me or, you know. I mean, I have some great suggestions for the kitchen and so forth. But I'm learning she's different. 
And that's one of God's greatest blessings in my life. And when you consider the people around you and the differences, and sometimes that gets on your nerves, and sometimes they do things differently, they think differently, and it bothers you, it bugs you. But can you imagine a painting that was just solid black? There you go. Oh, solid white. That's not a painting. That's boring. A beautiful painting has texture and has layers and has different colors or there's a perspective. There's a lot going on in a beautiful painting that we can appreciate. And so it is with life that God just didn't make. You know what I do, a stick figure, and I struggle to find a different kind of a stick figure. I'm not a great artist. My kids are much better than I am. And when you look around and you consider that God's plan was to make you exactly how he made you, and then you consider the greater purpose in that, that as you place your faith and trust in his son, Jesus, who died for you, then you come to the understanding of what your life is all about, the ultimate purpose and meaning and glory of life to know him and to make him known. And it's from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, he is gathering a people which only enhances his rule. The more kingdoms a king has the greater his kingdom, the greater his glory. If your only influence is over the people that bear your last name, that's not really significant. But this king will have a people from every shade, tongue, tribe, nation. He is our king. So we're growing. I don't want a selfish outlook in my life. I need to make people like me. That's, that's what we need to do. Now, if that is in marriage, it's marriage draining. It's life sucking. Drains people around you in relationships. The proper disposition is, how can I, how can we serve one another? How can we love one another? How can we help one another? How can we as men lead our wives and love our wives? This has a very practical application for every marriage, for our parenting. My kid, I grew up playing softball and this kid's going to play softball and trying to somehow live out your expectations through them. No, no, train up a child in the way he should go. What is God's plan for that child? Be about that. Direct him or her in that model. It has implications for our relationships here in the church, in the body of Christ. How can we as a collected group of people, we're so different in so many ways, how can we be unified and conform to the image of Christ? Now, this is the real question that Paul is concerned with, that we ought to be concerned with as a faith family. What is God's will for his church? What is God's will for this church? How do we as a church rightly balance reaching people for Christ and raising up disciples who make disciples for Christ? It's no small task. It always has been an immense task, and it always will be for every church, for every pastor, for every people. So as pastors, we're ongoing. There's an ongoing evaluation of all that we do and the ministries that we do and the structure that we are. Are we biblical? Are we doing a lot, but are we doing the most important thing to the best of our ability? If a donut shop makes bad donuts, oh, but we have the good ice. So what? Change it to the ice shop then. We're the church, and what are we to be doing? Making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Now, you have your spot there in 1 Corinthians 10. Will you turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5? In Matthew chapter 5, we want the words of the Lord Jesus to set the stage for Paul's instruction in 1 Corinthians 10, which is part of a much broader section where he's answering this simple question. 
we would say. But Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus speaking, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light unto all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. Why? That they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your light shine before men. And when men are looking at our lives as believers, the end goal that Jesus is intending here is that they will say, who is this God that you serve? How can we know him? We'd love to tell that. We live to tell the gospel. What impact is the light of Grace Community Church having in this world? What impact are we having right here in our neighborhoods? And what impact are we having in the world? Think about this, impact. Think about different, some of you have been in an accident, there's an impact, it has results. What impact are we having as a body of believers? We're trusting God for future grace to allow us to have the most impact we can possibly imagine for God's glory. We want to make our lives count, do we not? We want to make the most significant impact we can with our one life. So the pastors, that office described in the Bible, the eldership, They're to care for the flock, to equip the congregation, to care for one another, and for those who will become part of the flock. My concern this morning in impact is that proper care is given to the body, but that the body is also concerned with one another and with those who are not not yet part of the body. They haven't yet come to know Christ. So today we are going to see how Paul finally answers the question about, should we eat meats offered to idols? His response is in the framework of God's providence and God's glory. You see, what is our impact? We ought to have an impact here, and I believe we are. But the next slide is going to show up the impact, depending on how bright our light is here at home, how will our impact be connected to those that we partner with around the world. We, as a group of believers, we are partnered. We just don't send a check to these individuals. We are partnered with them. We love them. We communicate with them. We pray for them. They come visit us when they're able. Richard and Julia will be here in June. Ken was just here. Ir- uh, Irfan was here not long ago. We just met Corey last year. The bandas were here. We love these brothers and sisters in Christ, don't we? Okay? They are part of us in partnership. And if we are strong at home, we are more of a blessing. When a need comes in from the Shaws and they say, we're going further into West India. Can you help us? And depending on our strength and our stability and our ability, we can either say we are there and we've been praying for this, or we say, oh, dear brother Isaac, I hope that some church somewhere is strong enough to be able to go with you in there and we'll pray for you and that's not to discount prayer. But we want to be the church that says we are ready and we are willing and we are able. We will help you. Is that how you think of missions? Is that how you think of needs in the world? We can grow and we must grow in how we relate to one another. The title of the message is Working Out the Differences. If we don't work out the differences, we are not strengthening partners in this partnership. Let that sink in. We are here for God's glory And as we grow and strengthen, we are stronger partners. So we must grow. 
learning how to work out matters of disagreement while keeping our focus on reaching people for Christ. This is exactly what we as a church need from God's word. And he's ordained this for us today. 1 Corinthians 10. I'm going to start reading in verse 23. Paul says this, and here he's quoting their phrase back to them again. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Eat whatever is sold in the market, the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe, you might underline that, invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, well, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and in all its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please, as I all, as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. This is the word of God. Now, Paul is quoting here when he starts this section, all things are lawful. And if someone says, you know what, I can do whatever I want. I'm a Christian. I'm on my way to heaven. Does that really reflect a life of a person who listens to the voice of their shepherd? Does that really sound like a person who cares about those who are still outside of the sheepfold? I had a professor in college who referred to that faulty type of perspective as somebody with a get out of hell card free. Oh, I pray to prayer so I can do whatever I want. I'm on my way to heaven. It doesn't matter what I do. And that's wrongful thinking. They feel wrongfully that they're entitled to do whatever they want to do. And, hey, it's lawful for me. I can do it. Paul immediately pushes back against this type of thinking. And he asks questions. And he offers instruction guided by the Holy Spirit. The choices that we make, brothers and sisters, will either increase and strengthen the body, the fellowship in the body, lead to a stronger body, a more vibrant witness to the world, or the choices we will make will weaken and hurt the body, leading to a, to a diminished influence and a diminished mission for us around the world. How can we, we're all so different, how can we make righteous choices for the glory of God and for the good of others? This is so important. By God's grace, this is what we want to see from the text this morning. When I say making right choices, I want you to understand what I'm saying. I'm talking about our attitudes. It's not just the things that are seen. It's having a right attitude, right actions, and right behaviors a right disposition, making right choices. It means thinking rightly. It leads us to a careful evaluation in each situation that we're faced with. So if I'm going to choose what is best, it means that here's the prayer. By God's grace, I will make right choices as I, number one, resolve to always do what is helpful and constructive. Paul gives a lot of general instruction. Now, I'm amazed if you just have your Bible there, you look back, you just turn the page back. He started answering this question, which if I was to ask this question, you know, okay, uh, by a show of hands, those of you who really wrestled with, should you eat meat offered to idols this last week, please raise your hand. From the local temple. Okay, not one of us here dealt with that particular issue this past week. Now, if we lived in different nations... That, that, that might be something still viable. However, Paul has gone chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, 
Do you see all of the textual space that Paul has devoted to this question? And how he has addressed this is important, knowing the Holy Spirit, knowing not everybody everywhere is going to have to deal with this particular question. But he just doesn't pass over the question. He just doesn't say, sure, fine, eat the, yeah, eat the meats. He doesn't say, no, don't offend anybody. Don't eat meats ever. He doesn't say that. He is carefully treating this question because we're all different. And we think differently. And we love different things. But if we belong to Christ, we're going to learn how do we reconcile? How do we work through our differences so that the witness to the world is something different than local other organizations and clubs and workplaces? Are you tracking with me? If... By the grace of God, I will make right choices. Then I will resolve to always do what is helpful and constructive. All things are lawful. They're, they're using that phrase, and there are some in the Corinthian church, like, I'm a Christian. I don't care. I can eat whatever I want. And those new Christians, those weak believers, they just need to, they just need to get with the program. They just need to understand. They'll be okay. Eat the meat with us. We should never engage in sin. Just, well, you know, what shall we say then, Paul writes? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Hey, I can do it. No, God forbid. Certainly not. He answers that question. Now, as we begin to think about what are lawful things truly, you start with the realms of authority in your life. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. That's the place to begin. Operate within the realm of your home for the glory of God to obey the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Church members, Hebrews tells us, obey them who have the rule over you. According to the word of God, what does the word of God say? So a church member, here's my realm of authority. A citizen, Romans 13 tells us, 1 Peter 2, that we submit to the laws of the lands as we're not commanded to disobey against God. When we're brought into disobedience against the Lord, then we have to make difficult choices. Learning to choose what is best, Paul says, yeah, okay, all things are lawful, but hey, is everything helpful? Is your choice helpful? Will my action be profitable and advantageous for the well-being of others? Now, you would say, well, yeah, if everybody just does what I want, yeah, then that would be easy. And if anybody needs to know what to do, just ask me and I'll tell you. You've misunderstood this. This isn't for you to go tell everybody else, here's my thing and you don't do that. And I just solved that for you. What other questions do you have? This is the evaluation for you personally as you make choices, not for you to hold it up to everybody else. You're offending me. You're offending me. You're offending me. And you're not supposed to do anything to offend me. That would be a misapplication of this text. You have to make these choices, these thought choices. Is this helpful? I'm going to have to pray about this. I'm going to have to counsel with those who are near me. I'm going to have to evaluate this. Listen, when the doctors decide to operate, they are seeking to be helpful by hurting the patient. But if they don't extract the disease, the tumor, the brokenness, then they are ultimately hurting the person. And sometimes that gets confusing, especially when it's, well, here's my opinion and I can do this and don't confront, don't tell me differently. Ultimately, that may lead to a setup and we'll see more of that. Will my choice edify? The word is construction terminology. Ginger's home church in Kentucky, when they built a new auditorium across the road on Oak Hill, and they had the brick walls all put up, and then came a storm, and the brick walls fell down, and they had to haul all the rubble away, and they had to start all over. There was a flaw in the architectural design, and they had to change some things, and they were very glad that it didn't happen after it was opened and people were gathering to worship in the building. This is a construction. To, will it build up? Believers deeply desire the building up of others in their family, in their church family, and beyond. So this is, this is a very, this is important. I will resolve to 
Always do what is helpful and constructive. Secondly, I will seek the good of others over and above the good for myself. Again, this is general instruction. He's not yet specifically dealing with the, well, what about the meats, Paul? Can you get to the point already? We just ask you a question. Can we eat the meats? You see, if I seek the good of others over and above the good for myself, this is what it means to be selfless instead of selfish. Relationships thrive on selflessness, but relationships die on selfishness. Philippians 2 tells us that. Relationships where someone is, let me call them. Let me reach out to them. Relationships will thrive in that environment, giving grace. But relationships will die when someone is on the other end. You didn't call me. You didn't do that for me. You didn't reach my expectation. Seeking the good of others over and above the good for myself. We're not to seek our own advantage. Philippians 2 tells us that. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're to seek the advantage of others. This is wanting the best for others. This is not Frank Sinatra's song, My Way. It's the opposite of that. How can I help you? And again, this is tricky because sometimes people will say, well, the way that you can help me is you can do what I want all the time and you can do this and you can do that and you can stop doing the other and that will help me. And the doctor might say, yeah, you think so, but I'm going to tell you ultimately, no, that won't help you. Your thinking is wrong. That's why Paul devotes so much textual space to this because easily once I was like, yes, okay, finally the message that helped my wife out was this one. And she's saying, I hope he's listening. He finally preached the message for my husband. Seek the advantage of others. Why is this so hard? Do babies come out of the womb seeking the advantage of others? No. Mom, you're tired. I'm good. Sleep some more. Said no baby ever. It's okay. Diaper is a little loaded, but that's all right. Uh Uh-uh. We come out saying, ah, Frank Sinatra, my way. Just sounds differently, not so so beautiful. We're sinners by birth. We're sinners by nature. We're sinners by choice. We're dead in trespass and sin. Go with me to Ephesians. Look, Look at our condition. Apart from the gospel, apart from what God has done, Ephesians chapter 2. This is going to come up in our home Bible fellowship tonight. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and you, when Paul's writing to believers, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. That is the resume of a non-believer. It's not good, and it's not pretty. Thank the Lord for verse 4. But God... Can we all say that? But God. Okay, if it ended there, we're not here singing this morning. But God. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. That's where he's going and has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
That is who we were. And then we see, but God in Christ, who we now are. We are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. We are told here as believers that all eternity he will lavish his love on us. I just wanted to be with you and you to be with me. I want to share my joy with you. Oh, the goodness, the greatness of the gospel. This is only possible because of the new, through the new birth. On our own, we'll never seek the good of others over and above the good for self. That doesn't happen naturally. That is a result of the new birth. The work of God in us by the Holy Spirit. Number three, now here we get to specific instruction. Rest in God's providence when sharing the gospel. Now, I want you to think about this. When was the last time that a non-believer, okay, I had to really work with this this week and, and think through this. When was the last time a non-believer said to you, I want you to come share a meal with me because I want to know you better and I want to know more about what you believe. When was the last time a neighbor or a coworker said, can we go to lunch? Can we go have coffee? I want to get to know you better. There's something different about you. And they may not have, I'm not asking if they, you know, I'm quoting them. You get the idea behind this that somebody watched you live, heard you talk, and they said, there's something different and I want to know what it is. That's the scenario that Paul is setting up. And if we only think this context to be how we work out disagreements for us to get along, we miss the point that which Paul is trying to remind them, there's a lost world. And if we all say, well, you know, nobody's really asking me to join them in life, then who cares if you eat the meats or not? You've lost the plot. Paul cared enough to go share the gospel with them. And so the idea behind all of this is that there's such grace, mercy, forgiveness, long-suffering, forbearing with one another. We work out our differences that somebody notices who isn't yet a Christian. And they say, how do you do that? I need to know more about that. I see that in your marriage. I see it in your family. I see the joy that you have. I want to know more about that which is different than us just simply going, and it's not wrong, hey, can we tell you about Jesus? Can we tell you? Does anybody ask us, can you give me a Bible? Can we go have coffee? Can you come to my house? Now think about this. I think this will help us understand this. If someone says to you, you get the email, don't check your email right now, okay, you can check it later, and they say, we want to invite you over, you and your wife, whoever, you come over and, and, and share a meal, and you walk in their home, and you're like, this is amazing. They don't go to church with me. They don't even know Christ. As a matter of fact, I think they're maybe uh, Muslim, or they're atheist, or they're Buddhist, or whatever, and you walk in their house. How will this meal go if you immediately start with, you really sure that you should have that image on your wall? Um, where'd you get this food from? Oh, it's Friday and you're Catholic. Um, I, 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 do you have steak for me in Lent? Now, how much are they going to be sitting down to say, can we talk and can we share if you've just absolutely offended them? And you look over everything. Well, look, you see how their kids are behaving? <gasps> they eat that. Oh, I would never eat that. That's not this. Do you see what is going to fall apart? You're not going to get to the most important thing, and that is the gospel. They're saying, why did I invite this person over if all they're going to do is judge me and criticize me? I was seeking for some answers, and instead I just got a package of their version. What happened here? That's important to understand in this. So Paul is appealing to, we're going to love God, we're going to love people. He starts off with the, the marketplace. All right, you go shopping, you go to the marketplace, you go and there's meat hanging there, just, just get it. Just buy it. Don't ask the person selling. Now, you can tell me, did you get this from the back of the temple? Don't ask them. Just say, uh, can I have that thing hanging there? What is that exactly? Have you ever been to a foreign country and you see the meat hanging? Whoo! I'll take some of the green. 
what exactly meat is green? Ginger warned me of that when we went to Mexico. She's like, the chicken will be green. Chicken's not green. It was green. It was real green. She's like, I told you. Kind of looked like glorified frog legs. That's what I was thinking. Don't ask. Eat whatever sold in the marketplace, the meat market. Don't ask. It all belongs to the Lord. Christians can eat with thanksgiving and without guilt because he quotes Psalm 24, 1 and 50, 12. This was a Jewish mealtime blessing. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. You have been provident and you have provided animals. This is the curb to vegetarianism as a belief. The Lord has provided it all and we're not to elevate animals or anything else to an, a status of approaching worship. This is the Jewish blessing that says, the Lord has provided it, and we will simply say, thank you, and eat it. And we'll give thanks to him, because he didn't have to provide it. Just think, I mean, he could have given, like, here's one fish, and you get gophers. You know, there you go. He didn't. All the different types of animals, fish, you name it. Fruits, vegetables. 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, Paul deals with it a, a, even more precisely. Eat the meats. Give thanks to God. Don't let somebody tell you, don't eat the meats. And there, it's stemming from in, in 1 Timothy 1 through 4, 1 through 4, a doctrine of demons is saying, you can't do, don't do, and putting all these rules in. Mark chapter 7, Jesus deals with food goes in your body and then it's eliminated. It's not what defiles a man that goes in. It's what comes from the heart. There's where the real defiling is. And the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit alone can deal with that. So then here's these two different dinners. Now think about this. When you think of someone who is constantly invited into mealtimes with sinners, who do you think of? Jesus. They always wanted Jesus. And what did the religious Pharisees and the religious leaders? Why does your master always eat with sinners? We would never think of eating with sinners. And how he was able to sit down with them and relate to them and love them and the conversation and not just be offensive, but say, I know, you know, dear Samaritan lady that you long for water. But if you would have asked me, I would have given you living water. He loved her. Dinner number one, the host serves the meat, doesn't say anything about it. Give thanks, eat it. No reason to worry. Dinner number two, I think this is different. Think about in the context of you were saved out of the, the temple worship. And somebody says, hey, I, we want you to come. Come on, buddy. You know, come to our house. Bring your wife. Bring your kids. Come on, eat it. And they sit you down and they say, now you know, I got this, I got this meat at the temple. You know, we're missing you at the temple. You know, your prostitute down at the temple is really missing you. We, why don't you come back? Come on, just come back for the, we got a festival coming up. Come on, come back. And you hear it as more of a setup here. Now the gospel is in question of this person is almost like attempting. It's like there, there's a weak conscience. You, you, you're going to do something else if you say, oh, let's eat meat. I got to have meat. They served it. Now, in order to get to the gospel, you're going to say, you know what? no. I'm not wanting to go back to that lifestyle, but I do care about you. So I'm going to bypass the meat, but I still care about you. And I want to have this conversation with you. And I want to talk with you. I don't want to offend you so that I didn't bring it up. You brought it up and there's something behind what's going on. So I'm going to show my liberty by I don't have to eat it. Is this making sense? To not confuse the gospel. Ultimately, there's only one judge. In verse 30, Paul here rightly applies Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged. We will not stand in the judgment before the consciences of other people. We will stand in judgment before God who is holy. So therefore, we're careful in how we deal with one another, but we don't want to ultimately lose sight of non-believers and confuse the gospel. So in verse 31, Paul returns to general instruction saying, do everything for God's glory. That's at the heart. Therefore, from the mundane to the magnificent, if we're eating or drinking, or hey, check this, Corinthians, whatever you're doing, do all to the glory of God. Do your work to the glory of God. Serve at home, wherever in your community, in the church, to the glory of God. 
married couples, sex is for the glory of God, not for your own enjoyment alone and fulfillment. And it's for the glory of God. It's everything. Shovel snow for the glory of God. Sing for the glory of God. Fill in the blank. Whatever you do, do it for God's glory. That takes mundane tasks, tying your shoes, picking out what you're going to wear. Good choice, Dave. All right. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. He kind of leaves the one argument, and he takes it broad. Do everything for the glory of God. What does our purpose statement say? We exist to glorify God. That's our aim, to make much of Christ. That's what it means to glorify God. It's the reason for our existence. It plays out in the daily routines of life, not just on Sunday. The simple becomes significant when we understand the reason behind and for all that we do. And this glorifies God. When Christ is exalted, the Father is pleased. This is my beloved Son. Did you hear the scripture reading this morning? The Father sent the Son. And what did we do to the Son? We killed him. And he didn't just wipe us out. That's love. That's how we know the Father's love. He pardoned us because Christ died in our place. Number five, if I'm going to make right choices, then by the grace of God, I will choose to not be offensive to others. I have to make this resolution. I have to choose to not be offensive to others. Verse 32. This is what when Paul says, I'm going to become all things to all men. I'm just not going to offend people because that's who I am. Deal with it. Well, that's the way I was raised, so get over it. Well, that's just the way they may. I just say whatever I want to say, so deal with it. That's just who I am. Yeah, that can be sinful. That shouldn't really be something to brag about. That might be something to repent of. Choose to not be offensive to others. Verse 32. Give no offense. And he lists these groups, either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Don't offend. Don't put stumbling blocks. This this would have required great care and concern to not cause Jews to stumble. That's why he said, Timothy, you need to be circumcised. Because your your father was a Greek, your mother's a Jew, and Jewish people are going to say, what, you don't like, you're, you're ashamed of your Jewish heritage? So let's eliminate that for the sake of the gospel. Now, the Gentiles, Titus, (laughs) No, you're not being circumcised because that's going to confuse the gospel. You're a Gentile. And so if physically nothing happens to become a follower of Christ, born again, it happens inside. So no, you're you're not going to be circumcised. We're not going to offend Gentiles by simply saying, here's a Jewish custom. Take it and embrace it. And then he zeroes in on, what about our brothers and sisters in Christ? The church of God. By all means, no obstacles should be place there. And the Corinthian church was seriously losing sight of this important characteristic of a con- congregation. In Romans 12, 18, as much as depends on you, live at peace with all men. And the Corinthians weren't. They were saying, you do what I want you to do, and then we'll call it peace. Instead of working through this for the number six, salvation of many. Seek the salvation of many. Do you hear Paul's heart through this passage trying to return their vision to mission-minded instead of just going from meeting to meeting to meeting about this and this and this? What about the mission? They're just making a mess, and he's trying to call them back to the mission. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, my own advantage, but the advantage of many, that they may be saved. Paul lived an example. He brought the gospel to Corinth. He loved them. He didn't come for his own benefit. He didn't come to Corinth and and seek out his own perks. He came to Corinth for their advantage. He wanted to spend eternity in heaven with them. He wanted them to be forgiven and know Christ, so he came. This was his passion. I want many people to come to know Christ, that they may be saved. Let me ask us, is this at the heart of everything we do? That many 
will be saved. If it is, then we will abide in Christ, we will love one another, and our witness to the world will be bright. And chapter 11, verse 1, unfolds with a closing, I believe it's wrongfully divided there, where Paul says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. I'll make right decisions by God's grace when I follow the Christ-exalting leader. The tense that he writes this is, ever become imitators of me. And you could say, as he imitates Christ. Paul is an impeccable pattern to follow. And what does he do? He points to Jesus. Philippians 3.17, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. So we have in Scripture the example of Paul, but, but get this. Paul's not going to knock on the door and say, actually, um, wise, you can sit down. I'll take over. I'll really tell you everything I had in mind when I wrote this. Okay, when we get to heaven, we, we straighten all this out. The things we don't understand and can't figure out. But Paul's not doing that. God's given you me. Some days he gives you Jamie. Some days he gives you others. But Paul is a good example because he's pointing to Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Jesus is the ultimate pattern to follow. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came not to be served, but to serve. So if he is our master, then does that describe our lives? So the Lord has given to his church pastors, elders, shepherds, to have an example or examples with you, near you, close to you, that you might follow. Turn with me to Hebrews. It's a text familiar to us, Hebrews chapter 13. I've read this many times. God in his wisdom has provided for his church men of God. And when the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, verse 7, says, Remember those who rule over you, who lead over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Then, as you think about verse 7, you're immediately going to come up with, yes, but every pastor has shortcomings, struggles, weaknesses, sin, stubborn areas. We're not, a, we're not a finished work yet. So it could lead people to say, well, you know, I really want to love and serve God, but you know, my pastor, he's just not out there far enough in front of me. So that's my excuse and my struggle. That's why verse 8 is in here. Because you're, if if a person is tempted to think when the pastor is exactly like Jesus, then I'll engage. That'll never happen. That is expecting a human to be God. And we make, as pastors, expecting to be God. Always with me, always there, always, always, always meet my expectations. We make bad gods. Jesus Christ is the same Yesterday, today, and how long? Forever. Forever. So that's why Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And if you ever can't see Christ, look to him. And let love be forbearing and long-suffering. And we forgive one another and we pray for one another and we encourage one another and we remain in fellowship with one another as God leads. By God's grace, we will grow in our love and in our commitment to work through the differences in such a way that we as the church will demonstrate the great love and grace of God our Savior. And it's my prayer this happens in our homes, that this happens in this congregation, so that the world, those who don't know Christ yet, 
they will see there's something different there. And then we come right back to where we begin, Matthew 5, 16. We understand what it means to let your light shine. It means you forgive the person next to you when they offend you. It means you have hope when you go through the worst of situations and the news comes back from the doctor and it's bad. But your hope is secure in Christ and you're able to trust him when the people around you love you but they don't know exactly what you're experiencing or going through. But they love you and they'll simply be in proximity to you to encourage you, pray for you, to love you, to be there for you. That's what it looks like to forbear with one another. God help us to not function like that kid in the raft. Can you slow down? No. By God's grace, we'll consider one another. We'll resolve to always do what is helpful and constructive. Can you ask these questions of yourself right now? Is that me? Is that how I look on other people? I want to help. I want to build up. That, and I'm not saying perfectly. There's no one here that like, yes, 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 that's me. No, but do we, do we intend that we seek the good of others over and above our, the good for myself? That we rest in the providence of God as we share the gospel? That by God's grace, we'll do everything for God's glory? That we will purposely choose to not be offensive? That we'll seek the salvation of many? And by God's grace, we'll follow the Christ-exalting leader? Each of these resolutions should be considered rightly, personally, and applied to our lives. We're instruments of grace. I've been using this statement since we changed our name. That we, what are we? We are a graced people, bringing the gospel of grace to all peoples. What does this mean? If you're here with us this morning, then this just in. If this is your first time, you're sitting in a room of people who are not perfect. We don't have it all together. Marriages go through ups and downs. Parenting isn't all what it should be. You're sitting in a room of misfits, okay? Let's just cut it straight. We don't have it all together, but we are held within the grace of the Lord Jesus. That's the difference. So we aren't looking down on people around us because you don't have it together and you don't. That's a Pharisee. That's false. That's a hypocrite. We are thankful that God has shown us his grace, his mercy, and because he has done that, this for us, this is why we're here, to bring this good news, this great news, this life-changing, eternity-changing message to you today and to the entire world. That's who we are. And knowing who we are shows us what we do by God's grace, we will be this people, grace, a community, and we are his church. Our name says a lot about who we desire to be. It's who we are. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for your grace. We need your grace. If anyone is here without Christ this morning, Father, if someone is here and they, are, they fear dying, they know that they have sinned and they long to be forgiven, may they turn from their sin, cry out to you, Lord, have mercy on me and trust in you to save them. And you will graciously redeem them. Father, Thank you for your church and thank you for your word. We cannot accomplish any of these goals of these resolutions unless the power of the risen Lord Jesus operates in our lives. In our flesh, in our own humanity, we will fail and fail and fail. But in the power of the resurrected Lord Jesus, we can stand and we can see situations that seem absolutely hopeless change. 
And God, you alone see all of the situations connected to the people here this morning, the marriages that are struggling, the parenting relationships with children broken, all of the struggles, the sickness, you name it, Lord, you see it. The only way that things will really truly change is that the resurrected Lord Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit and in his word changes the heart of wayward children, of distant spouses. So we're asking you to do this. In Jesus' name, amen.